specific suggestions, uh, things that we will uh, pick, pick up again uh, during the discussion uh, for our specific low-hanging fruit that we want to keep track of, no content blocking, transparency, undue preferences, and privacy and deep packet inspection. So keep all those um, on top of the table, and uh, we'll hear from Charlie Ang. Thank you. I'm going to uh, tonight uh, speak. I'll take Michael started with some specifics. I'm going to go to very generalities because uh, I have a confession to make. I'm not a techie. I hate plugging things in. I just want to turn it on and make it work. And I think many people are like that. Um, as well, I don't know if Tim Hudak is in the room, but his leadership ban was outside. So I want to say, Tim, it's okay. I think it'd be great if the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party got in on the issue of net neutrality. And if Tim is in the room and wants to come and join the discussion, uh, I don't know if Randy Hillier's here. Maybe they left. Okay. But it would have been great. Um, I want to say uh, at the outset, uh, you know, I was, my 10-year-old daughter does not believe there never was, she doesn't believe there wasn't an internet. It, she looks at me and, and laughs. It, it's, this is absurd, Dad. And I, I want to make a public admission here. I got it wrong. Uh, in 1984, I had this tech geek. I don't know, no offense to tech geeks, but he kept coming and bothering me. He said, you write things and you guys publish things. I could put them on billboards or bulletin boards. And I said, what would people do with these bulletin boards? And he said, well, they'd read them. And I'd say, well, who would be reading them? Don't people have a life? That they sit there with a the, the telephone cord? And I mean, I was into desktop publishing. I had my little Mac. And it, something that you read was on paper. And he kept saying, these bulletin boards are going to be big. And uh, I, I, one time I saw him at the grocery store, and I hid in the other aisle so I could avoid him. Because I just was thinking, this guy is too strange. Fast forward a few years, and I'm, I'm only telling you this because I think it frames how we come to understand the importance of, and I call it the digital commons. Fast forward a few years, and I was involved with a very uh, rural-based community group fighting a massive uh, garbage plan that had the backing of the Ontario government, the biggest waste management company in the world, and we were uh, a rural, considered a backwater in northern Ontario. And when you're in these situations, what they do is they baffle you with high-priced consultant bullshit, and you know they're lying to you. You know it's BS, but they've got technical data and you don't. And you have no way of getting technical data. And a friend said to me, you should really try this thing called the internet. And I said, yeah, whatever, I sit there, that's kind of like bulletin boards. He said, type in anything. <laughs> so I typed in one of the technical questions we had about this crazy scheme they were selling us. And we got technical reports from the University of Virginia. We got technical reports from California. And suddenly, a very ragtag group of native people and loggers and farmers were on the same level as the consultants. And we went on to win that battle, the Adams Mine Garbage Dump. And we went on to win one of the biggest toxic waste wars afterwards because we were suddenly empowered. And we could vet their information. And we could find our own experts to their high-paid consultants. And I realized then that this changes the democratic game forever when you have that level of empowerment of citizens. That's what the digital commons is about. And that's what we must never forget. As much as entertaining as it is, and I love watching uh, videos on YouTube, what is at the core of this discussion is protecting the digital commons so that the empowerment of average citizens can go on and they can make their choices, and they can be part of what is now emerging as a new way of communicating and a new economy. And it wasn't Rogers or Telecoms who built those original bulletin boards. It was people who believed that if you put information up there, people would connect. That's the starting point. So how do we put that into issues of public policy? Well. Uh, Michael did meet the Senators and that's great, I've got to take some of the stuff I've said about them back. The only thing I hate more than the Senators is the hockey team or the Senators is politicians. Um, <laughs> my experience with politicians is that politicians are really bad with technical issues. They run from them because we're, uh, we're extreme generalists. I don't even get to read things anymore, I just read the yellow line where I sign my name. 
Uh, we don't have time. And what we're good at uh, is to quote my very good friend Bill Patry, uh, who's a great uh, lawyer on this, is moral panic. If something's really wrong, politicians have to stand up. That's why you see the crime agenda is always big. Politicians never go out of style with the crime agenda because there's a moral issue that has to be fought. So if there's a problem, we're good at shutting it down. But we're not really good at envisioning where we need to be. And that's a big problem. And you see that in the copyright issues. You see that in a lot of our digital issues. Uh, politicians are really wary. of They're afraid of the issue. But if it's an issue of locking it down, if it's an issue of penalties, we can be sold on that. So how do we change the nature of the discussion to get it back to the issue of the public interest? And that's what we're here to do. Well, number one, it's what you're doing. Uh, an active public and an active citizenry puts pressure on politicians. You won't believe how many politicians come up to me and say, what is this thing called net neutrality? Mm -hmm. they, they're spooked by it, and that's good. Then what you have to do is you have to unspook them so it's not so <laughs> terrible. The issue they'll say is that you know you can't you can't interfere with business. The business is, has a has a right to do you know to make money, and we agree in our system we have a system that's set up that the telecoms make money just like they make money in the broadcast industry. But we say in the in broadcast there's a public interest. The airwaves are public. And for all the money they're allowed to make, they have to meet certain small requirements. Politicians get that. So in terms of the public interest with the internet, is that we have to make sure that the giant vertically integrated mega corporations who are entertainment industries in their own right are not using uh, the one aspect of their service, which are the ISPs, to unfairly throttle competition to unfairly favor their own services as to their competitors. And they'll tell you, we would never do that. Well, then they wouldn't be capitalists if they would never do that. Because their fundamental job is to make money for their shareholders. And it would be insane for them not to do that if they had the opportunity. So why would we expect that they would do something in the public interest? It's not that they're bad. Is that they have to have rules. So we start with simple rules. Uh, I introduced Bill C-398, um, an act to amend the Telecommunications Act. If you read it, it won't look all that impressive. It's just a very short little bill. It just adds to Section 36 clarifying language that says they cannot uh, degrade content. They cannot prioritize or favor one set of content over the other. The telecoms will say it's in the act already, in a vague sort of way, as Michael said. But if it's already in the act, then they shouldn't mind it being clarified. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where the rub is. I, I was reading this IT magazine. Uh, I was writing about my bill where the NDP or something like we're claiming and making, we're trying to force this in, new net neutrality bill. You know, when you're the fourth party in a private member's bill, it's amazing how much, you know, you can be picking on these telecoms. And uh, they said that, uh, you know, the NDP had claimed that these telecommunication companies were vertically integrated giants with all kinds of uh, uh, entertainment subsidiaries, but we've provided no evidence. Well, I didn't think I needed to pr provide any evidence <laughs> to one of Canada's largest uh, IT magazines. I think it would be fairly bloody obvious what's happening here. Uh, you know, when you get your, uh, your sales to buy onto an internet service, they say, you know, come to, for our video on demand service. More downloads faster than ever. They're offering you a service at a price, and that's perfectly A-OK. -okay. But the internet, the, and the future development of the internet is based, and has to remain based, on the fact that you, as a consumer, but also you as a citizen, get to decide what content has priority.